Good afternoon. Uh, yes, I am Tim Perry. I work for Resin, and I want to talk to you about taking gateways and Linux devices generally into production. The larger issues you have to think about, the broad topics, um, the various areas we're going to look at and discuss, like provisioning and managing and monitoring, and how Resin can help you do this and can help you go from development through to having a real fleet out in the world. Ooh. It's a good start. <laughs> okay, um, so when I talk about going to production, I'm talking about taking devices out of your development environment, out of testing in places where you can easily fix issues yourself, where you can walk over and change things, and environments where nobody really minds if it breaks. Nobody critically depends on your devices. When you go to production, these things change. You can't just wander over and turn it off and on again. And people will get upset if your devices go down. You will have customers, other businesses, end users who depend on the things you're building. And this requires some changes in mindset. You need to think about how you're working and how you're building your systems differently. I think there's two core things you need to look out for. Firstly, that things are going to fail. Things fail a bit in development, but you can work with that and even encourage that. Bugs are great, they fall apart, you then investigate, fix them, and your software steadily gets better. That is a good thing to do, but is not sufficient in production. If you go out and have things break, that is a problem. Uh, but it's also, that alone is not going to get you to a stable place. Stuff is going to break anyway. Extremely rare bugs that you don't find that often will become quite major issues when you scale up. The real world is an unforgiving place. Hardware will fail. Devices break, disks corrupt, network connections go down, power is not as reliable as you want it to be. Things will break. So instead, you have to shift to a mindset where you're preparing to recover from failure, and you're ensuring that you rapidly find out about issues, preferably before they actually become major user-facing problems. And encouraging things like redundancy and so on helps to improve this. So I'm going to talk a little bit about ways that you can spot issues and ways that you can recover more rapidly once you get into production. You also need to be building for change. Uh, this is an easier thing to do when you're in a development environment. When you've got devices next to you, changing them is a relatively simple thing to do. We have customers with devices that are multiple hours drive from anybody in the business. It is not OK to have to drive out there and change things by hand. You need to be able to ensure that you can get as much of that iterative flexibility you have at development time still in production, because things are going to change. You're going to learn an enormous amount of stuff when you start setting up gateways and devices out in the real world. And you're going to want to be able to iterate on what you're building. Hardware for a long time has kind of ignored this. You try and build something that works really well, and then you ship it, and maybe six months later you do a firmware update that some people apply. The web world has got much better at this and is iterating on things daily or hourly. And being able to do that gives you incredible power to improve your product more effectively. So we want to be able to build systems that can change when we get them into production. I work for Resin, and Resin is what we're mostly going to be talking about as the tools to power this. Who's been to the workshop the rest of the Resin team have been running outside? Nobody. Great, because I'm going to cover the details. Ah, tragic. <laughs> it is, yeah, a bit oversubscribed. Um, so Resin is a platform for deploying and developing and managing devices, typically Linux devices. So most of the people using Resin are using devices something like this. So the Raspberry Pi is kind of the mainstay and is what we're working with outside and what we're mainly talking about. But we cover about 30 other boards, including stuff like the Intel Nook, um, NVIDIA's TX2, a bunch of other interesting bits and pieces, and the BeagleBone. There's a lot of interesting moving parts here, and we provide a platform where you can develop software on top of that and update it, manage those devices, put them out in the field without having to worry about the details of how that works and being able to focus on what your software does. The actual structure of this looks something like this. You've got a bunch of devices over on the right. Each of these are running a supervisor, which monitors what's happening on the device, talks to our services, starts and stops your application, and changes configuration, this kind of thing. That's then connected to our API and cloud services in the middle. 
you can push code through to this, so you git push. We then accept that code, build it in the cloud, so we run a Docker builder, which um, puts together your whole application and gives you a Docker image, which we can then ship to and start up and manage on devices. That goes through our Docker registry. Devices pick things up through a secure VPN that we manage, and status information then comes back out. And we've got a dashboard and a command line tool so that you can see what all your devices are doing and interact with them. And this gives you the kind of whole cycle of how you'd manage and use and change these devices. What we're talking about today specifically are the concerns when you get into production. So how you effectively set up large fleets of gateways and other devices. How you manage these devices so that you can change them, so that you can control them, and so that you can see exactly what they're doing. And how you monitor these devices so we know whether they're working, preferably before they break. Let's start with provisioning. Let's say you want to go from your small development setup, you want to start actually putting out whole fleets of gateways, tens, hundreds, thousands of gateways out into the real world. How do you actually set that up? There's a bunch of problems here. Um, the first thing is just being able to do this quite quickly, setting up a thousand devices if you're manually configuring SD cards and plugging them all in is quite a lot of work and error prone. And you also need to be able to do this reliably with existing devices. Things will fail, and you have to be able to take a device in the field, say, this is broken, I need to put in something that works exactly like this one as quickly as possible, ship that there, and have confidence that that's going to keep working. There's two main key solutions to this. Firstly, it's just avoiding manual work wherever possible. Perhaps this is obvious, but any time you're doing something instead of the computer, it's going to take longer, and you're more likely to fail. Computers are really good at boring, remote, repetitive tasks, and delegating all of that away solves a lot of the basics of this problem. A more nuanced challenge is controlling variability here. There are going to be differences between your devices. You're going to have different network configurations, slightly different actual configuration parameters, and all sorts. You need to be able to set up many devices um, and ensure that you know the differences between them and that you can effectively reproduce the differences in between them. It's very easy to end up with a thousand different disk images that differ in slightly different ways that you individually write to each thing, but you don't really understand what's going on. And that is a recipe for disaster. If at any point you lose those images, you then can't reproduce any of these devices. You need controlled ways to manage variability. The first way we do this at Resin is by making sure our images are self-registering. So the actual Resin dashboard looks like this. I've got two devices, these two Raspberry Pis here. If I want to go in and add a device, there's a button right here, and I select some basic configuration parameters that configure it for this application. Uh, so I can pick a version, I can set network properties, and so on. If I click Download, this is going to download a disk image for this Raspberry Pi application, and I then write that directly to an SD card, plug it in, and it starts up. Notably, that image is configured for this application, but it's not configured to be a specific device. If you write that same image to 100 SD cards, you plug it into 100 Raspberry Pis and turn them on, you'll get 10 independent devices in here, which are identical in every way, except they've registered their own unique IDs so that you can then manage them independently. You can trust that they're all running exactly the same initial thing, and you know the only difference between them is those IDs. And if you're in a position where that's all the configuration you need, that's kind of the dream end goal. You have one image. When you want to provision more devices, you just write it to more SD cards, plug it into more devices, and you're done. That's great. This gives you a useful base for this kind of thing. We also provide further tools because a lot of our customers are doing much more complicated provisioning solutions. So our CLI has a bunch of different configuration options in to do this in a more automated and controlled way and allow more complex features. So if we actually take a look at this, ooh, over here. Um, if we take a look at this, we've got, um, firstly, the ability to actually just download images directly on the command line. Let's make that a bit bigger. Um, so we can download images directly on the command line. Uh, this gives us a blank image that we can then manage and configure. 
and immediately start using and sorting out for the different variations of our device. Once you've actually got an image, uh, we can then configure this in various different ways. We've got a few options for things like pre-generating config files for some of those options you saw there, different network settings, various interesting specific details. The simplest example for this is if you simply want to know what ID your device is going to have before you turn it on. You want to have it pre-registered in resin, so you can start associating information with it. You can start setting configuration variables on it so that when you turn it on, you know where it's going to be, you know what settings it's going to have, the basic thing. So to do that, we can just run this straight from the command line. We run resin device register, and just like that, I create a new device. And I get a unique ID for that device, and I can immediately see in my dashboard uh, that I've now got this new device here. It's offline, it's never appeared. That device doesn't even exist. But it's there, and if I configure the image to use that device, when I then put that into a real Pi, it will start up in this slot. And I can go in and I can set configuration and start managing this straight away right now, even though it doesn't exist. And we'll talk a little bit about configuration in a minute. To actually configure the image is, again, fairly simple. So we go resin os configure. Um, I specify the image and some config. And then I just say the ID of the device I want to use. And that is now taking a blank image, putting everything that's required in it to start it up configured as this pre-registered device. And if I had a um, SD card in, I can run one more command, which will complain because I don't. Uh, run one more command and immediately write that to the disk. You can script all of these together because this is in a nice, convenient command line tool. And we can straight away start building tools where you just pre-generate 100 UUIDs, list through them every time I plug in an SD card, get the next ID, configure the image for that, flash it, repeat. And then the whole task to provision devices is just plug in the next SD card, put it in devices. And before they've even turned on, they're all there in the device, all there in resin. There's a lot of extra features in here I won't go into in depth, but you can do things like preloading the entire application so it will start up wor working without internet or all sorts of other things like this. It's got a lot of extra mass provisioning kind of tools available for this. This lets you automatically get a fleet of devices out into the wild. Very cheaply, easily, quickly, and reliably put out a lot of small things out there in the world. Unfortunately, that is not enough. Uh, here is a photo of one of the founders of Resin before Resin existed. They were working on a project which had gone in, into production perhaps too soon. They had a selection of smart bins across London that display kind of adverts and various information. They needed to go out and make a major change to them, so they had to walk around bins in London, plug in a keyboard, and sit there and run shell scripts. This is where you do not want to be. It's quite cold here, he's got gloves on, it starts snowing later in the evening. This is what happens if you don't have a plan in advance of getting to production that allows you to control these changes to manage devices. So, actually managing devices. Uh, this is kind of the mainstay of Resin. Once you've got the devices set up and running, we provide a dashboard and a CLI, and you can interact with the API directly to control and change and work with everything on there. The very simplest thing you're going to want to do is just push code. How do you update these deployed applications? In addition to pushing code, you also want to be able to make small configuration changes. So in the workshop, for example, we're configuring gateways to work to be in certain GPS locations, setting up your credentials. It's useful to be able to remotely change those without having to go anywhere near your devices, which could be anywhere, especially as your fleets get larger and larger. You also need tools that allow you to go to a device and work out what it's actually doing. Debug it, troubleshoot. Even if the device hasn't yet failed, you can start seeing symptoms that are problematic and you can want to investigate further. And it can be hard to reproduce real world production issues in the lab without being able to get more information. Being able to easily collect stuff from devices that may be incredibly inaccessible is a very useful feature. The very first thing we've got for this is just being able to push code. So let's do some of that. Uh, this is a simple JavaScript application. Let's make that a bit bigger, too. Um, simple JavaScript application. Don't worry about it if you're not too familiar with JavaScript. This is the interesting line here. We're setting a default color 
for these two pies. Currently, we set it to 255 naught naught, so they come up red. And we'd like to reconfigure this application. These devices are remote to this laptop. They're not actually even on the conference Wi-Fi. They're connected to my mobile network through my phone. These could be anywhere else in the world. And we want to go through and make configuration changes. So we change some code, and then we add the changes, and then we commit the changes, and then we push the changes. And this connects to the resin service, pushes the code up, and talks to the builder, which then starts building a Docker image. You don't really have to understand Docker in great depth to get started with resin, um, but you do get a lot of the advantages. Docker gives us caching all the way through, for example. So we don't, in rebuilding here, we don't reinstall any dependencies. We don't have to worry about any of that. We just copy in the new code. We've completely built everything now. We've uploaded the image to the registry, and we're done. And in a second, these are now going to start downloading the new versions. Um, again, just over this mobile connection, an update. And we can very quickly iterate on software with this kind of feedback loop. Not just on devices that are in front of you, but on devices that are anywhere in the world. While we wait for those to download through there, we've also got the dashboard that allows you to monitor things. So. Uh, this is the kind of main screen here. We can see all the devices within this application and various bits of information about them, what their current IP address is, which commits they're running, this sort of thing. And you can see they've now started downloading. We've got a lot of features for managing more complex lists of things here. With three devices, this is not too bad. If you get to 100 or 1,000 devices or a lot more, trying to organize these gets very hard. Just knowing where your devices are can get quite complicated. So on top of the basic things here, you can filter these not just by whether they're turned on or off, but which commit they're running, date ranges for when they created. You can, being, uh, you can collect sets of filters together and even tag devices with arbitrary key value metadata so that you can put together a view here that says, for example, show me only the devices that are very high priority running the latest code but are currently offline. And you can have that as a view that you can just click, open, and immediately see just that set of devices, and then start investigating further. In the devices themselves, um, we've got access to a bit more of the metadata, and also logs streaming through. So you can see here they're just waiting for deltas to come through for this download, because we do diffs on downloads to make them nice and binary, uh, nice and efficient in terms of data transfer, bandwidth efficient. Uh, so we can see logs both for the actual download process going on there, but also the application beforehand and everything that's going on here. We can also, for any arbitrary device, wherever it may be, click a button um, and in the web directly SSH into it. You can see this starting up and now it's green and the other. Um, and we can then connect into this and just start running scripts, start seeing what's going on, and try working out why it's working or not, see what's going on there. This makes a lot of actually managing problematic devices in production much easier. You can put out a fleet of gateways, and if one of them is not working correctly, you can click a button in the internet and immediately start playing around with it and seeing what's going on. And all of this is running over our VPN, so it doesn't get exposed to anything else on the local network near it or anything like that. OK. Um, with this, now we've got code we can change. We've got devices that we can put out here that we can uh, ship code to. And we can also reconfigure. So actually, if we go in here, we've got one more button that I missed there. We've got separate configuration parameters. Not only can you push new code to this, we do configuration by and large through environment variables, and we can immediately change those without any redeploy being required at all. So if you're looking closely at that code, you might have noticed that there's an override. There's a default color, now green. But if we set any other color as a JSON string in here and add it, the supervisor on the device will immediately notice. This is just for one device, not both. Uh, the supervisor will immediately notice, kill the application, restart it, and it turns blue. And you can make small configurations like this instantly for devices anywhere in the world. All of this gives us the ability to change things, the ability to investigate failures and try and iterate on our product. But unfortunately, it doesn't let us know whether things are actually working. 
often you want to be able to immediately find out when things break. You don't want to have to go through and individually look at your devices and run scripts to tell what's going on. You need actual monitoring solutions, actual tools that allow you to investigate what your system is doing as a whole and spot early issues. What we're really looking to do is spot symptoms before failure. If your disk is starting to, uh, starting to corrupt, you want to get stats on that kind of thing. If CPU usage has been slowly growing as demand on a gateway has been building over recent months, you want to see that before you start seeing problems. You want to watch network traffic. If network suddenly drops to zero, that is almost certainly a major problem that you need to be preferably seeing earlier. We need to be able to, what? We need to, be able to see these kind of issues as quickly as possible. Oh, OSX. It's just hidden Chrome for me. There we go. Um, we want to be able to see these kind of issues as quickly as possible. Uh, Resin provides primitives that allow you to do this. And we uh, connect, we're, we recommend connecting these up to various open source tools. And if you go and look outside of the workshop, I think they're running a monitoring dashboard for exactly this kind of thing. Here, we're using two uh, major open source projects called Grafana and Prometheus. Grafana does graphs. You give it data sources, and it lets you build dashboards and quickly see at a glance the overall status of individual devices or your whole fleet, or any other data you want to feed into it, really. Prometheus gives you tools to actually collect that data. So in this particular structure, we've got Prometheus node exporter on the right. This collects standard metrics from devices, things like CPU usage, um, disk usage, network traffic. And it exposes these through the Resin VPN. We provide a option to allow you to proxy web traffic directly through. So you don't have to worry about connectivity to your device. As long as it's on the internet at all, you just talk to us and we pass you straight through. Um, on the server side, you want to run a monitoring server somewhere. Right now, I'm running one on this laptop. Uh, and on that server, you have an instance of Prometheus Server, which talks to various exporters to collect data and then stores this and allows you to query over those metrics. That then gets fed into Grafana, which we'll see in a second, and Alert Manager. You can set rules in Prometheus to say, if this metric goes over this line for this amount of time, or whatever you might like, then trigger an alert. And this talks to Alert Manager, which has built-in integrations for sending you emails, but also pager duty, ops genie, various other options. And we'll do things like batch alerts together and not constantly um, announce the same thing over and over again, and various configuration options there. What this actually looks like is this. So here we have um, a current status dashboard showing everything that's going on in this fleet. Um, it's interestingly only got one device running, which is surprising. There we go. Um, so we've got two devices running. If I zoom this into more recent time, you can see what's going on here. Uh, we can see bits of CPU spikes and various small changes in memory, this kind of thing. And we can also actually go in and investigate individual devices. You can see the network traffic back and forth, which on gateways particularly is going to be one of those early signifiers of issues. Being able to see all of this, this information allows you to just stick up a dashboard in your office, stick up a dashboard that is visible to your team, and have all the time an idea of what your fleet should look like, and be able to spot issues, hopefully, before they become major problems. This is an example dashboard we've set up. Um, and in the slides, there's a link to the full tutorial to immedi immediately do this. It's a Git repo. You push to devices, and you run one command, and you start it on your machine, and then you're done. If you want to get to this level of monitoring, that just works. And you don't have to configure which devices you're using. It talks to the Resin API, works out which devices you have, and automatically starts querying them. So you can set up very basic dashboards like this very easily. And Grafana and Prometheus are both open source projects that will allow you to feed metrics in or add extra types of graph in however you'd like. They're extremely customizable for this sort of thing. Prometheus itself is also running here on this machine. Most of the time, you don't need to access this, but this is the underlying data source that Grafana is using to generate those graphs there. And we can run queries in this, so I can say, for example, how many of my devices are currently up. Great, two devices are up. 
This also is where the alerts are actually happening. So I can see currently it's upset that one device is down, that device we registered earlier that has never really existed, and it's currently got an alert set there. So it'll be talking to alert manager, trying to tell me about this. These actual rules, again, are all configurable. If you're not familiar with um, Prometheus, these might be a little obscure, but it you, takes only a little bit of getting used to. You, a service is down if any service up is false. The CPU threshold is too high if the average CPU over five minutes has been greater than 50%, this kind of thing. You can put together queries and then immediately start getting notifications about that and immediately know the status of your devices. Know when your gateway network traffic is, for some reason, dropping at what should be a peak time, this kind of thing. Okay, all of this put together lets us build for failure. When stuff breaks, you know about it. Hopefully before stuff breaks, you've got the metrics that allow you to spot issues as they start to arise. And when things do go wrong, you can troubleshoot devices and you can push changes and fixes to them. You can change properties in the real world, wherever those devices are, and keep control of that fleet around the world. This allows us to change things and iterate. You can write your code, put it into production without having to worry that it's perfect immediately. When new security updates come out for the Things Network gateway, you can immediately pull those down, push those straight out. Patches, changes, configuration tweaks. All of this stuff you can iterate on after getting out into production and into the real world. That's everything I've got for you today. Uh, I am Pim Terry on Twitter, and I'll be sticking the slides out if you want to go through and have a look at those later. Um, we are probably short on time for questions, but I and the other two Resin team members will be around. Come and talk to us. Uh, if you've got any questions about developing and getting set up on Resin or about taking it out to production, let us know. Thank you. <laughs>